the hon. Robin uh, McSweeney. Thank you, Mr President. May I say how fitting it is that we both get to say the last valedictories in the 40th Parliament. We are both members of the South West until the end of this week and have shared many years in our electorate and have both made a significant difference in many people's lives. I have only done a mere 16 years to your 30, but congratulations, you've been a very fine president and can be really proud of your career. It was Barry that told me at the beginning of my career that if I wanted a friend in politics, then go and buy a dog. <laughs> Such is the nature of politics. <laughs> I always knew that I would enter Parliament. Since 1982, when I was 24, I've written letters to myself to be opened 10 years into the future. The first letter I opened in 1992 was about family. And having had two girls, I said I would like another girl and a boy, and that happened. I also said I wanted to go back to study. I did, and completed a degree in politics, sociology and philosophy in three and a half years, and was a Justice of the Peace by 1992. The next letter I sealed was to be opened in 2002. And in this letter, I said that by the time I opened this one, that I wanted to be the member for the South West for the Liberal Party, and I was sworn in in May of 2001. During this period, I became one of the first women, along with Deborah Bentley, to become a state vice president of the Liberal Party. The next letter was to be opened in 2012, and in this one, I said that I was going to be the minister for what was then known as Family and Children's Services and Women's Interests. When the letter was opened, I had been minister for child protection, community services, seniors and volunteering, youth and women's interests since 2008. I have written another one for 2022, and I know I said I would write a book, and that has been completed and published. And I said I would have retired from politics, but I don't believe it was meant for 2017. <laughs> it was not my choice to leave. It was the electorate's choice, as after having three Liberals in the South West for 30 years or more, we returned one member, and I was number three on that ticket after uh, being number one for many years. I've always been very focused and determined, but you have to have some luck along the way to make all the stars align, and they did for me. I've kept all these letters because they are eerily accurate, and sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. My interest in politics was always in the background. I remember when I was five years old, running up the driveway to tell my dad when he arrived home from work that the American president, JFK, had been shot. And he looked at me with a shocked look on his face and said, yes, it's a terrible day. I had always known that my family had played a significant part in developing our state, and in particular, my great-grandfather, Albert Edmund Cockrum, who I wrote my 728-page book on, was one of the wealthiest men in Australia born in WA at Gin, Gin in 1870 and was a Hale School boy. He owned Burswood Island and turned part of it into Belmont Racecourse and Goodwood Racecourse. He was the largest importer of thoroughbreds into Australia, sometimes bringing in 150 horses a year from the UK, and I'm talking about 1908. He had huge tracts of pastoral land, owned Griffin Coal, developed Perth Central Business District and was a pioneer in agriculture. This country has much to thank him for. Myself and the Honourable Mark Lewis would kill for his knowledge of a good racehorse. <laughs> Sadly, that talent evaded me. However, Mark keeps on trying. And I know Helen alongside me, her family's in horses and they've had more luck than me. My great-great-grandfather and grandmother were George and Mary Lazenby. George sailed his own ship into WA in 1831. He was an architect who designed the Wesley churches, and he was Perth's first shire clerk. He was also the first church minister for the Wesleyans in WA. Now, I'm an Anglican, but in WA at that time, the Wesleyans were not particularly welcome. His wife, Mary, started a girls' school, and she was a teacher. And there is a plaque in Wesley Church commemorating George Lazenby. The Honourable Peter Jurak, who was the former Australian Attorney General in the Fraser Government, shares George and Mary with me as our first grandfather and grandmother that arrived in the colony. 
The first sitting we had after I was sworn in as a minister, there was a condolence motion for the Honourable Peter Jurak, and I wanted to get up and speak about our family history, but it was not to be, so perhaps I've now made up for it. My great-grandfather, Albert Cochrane, was mentioned in my first speech in this House, so it is fitting that I mention him in my last. I never imagined writing a book on him back then. <laughs> His sometimes business partner with horses was James Nicholas, who was Gina Reinhardt's grandfather. They won the Sydney Cup together with a horse called Ian Orr. James Nicholas was also a business partner of Sir Sidney Kidman, and I was in Adelaide the day Gina took control of Kidman stations, and I wish to all the very best. Sir Sidney Kidman and James Nicholas are also in my book, Albert Edmund Cockrum, King of the Race Course, 1870 to 1943. The Honourable Norman Moore was kind enough to launch my book at Ascot, and Gina also made a speech and was kind enough to autograph my books uh, for people. I also shared history with Gina as she christened the first trains that rolled into Roy Hill. She is a remarkable woman and one I'm proud to call my friend. Australian politicians need to cut red tape and make it easier for people like her to invest in our great country. It was ridiculous and chaotic that she had to have 4,000 government approvals to start Roy Hill. There has to be a smoother process for business to flourish in this state and Australia. The Honourable Ken Baston's people are also in my book, as they were pioneers of the Carnarvon region and own Cobber Station. Where did 16 years go and where does one start? So many good times and so many, and some very dark, hurtful times. Which parts to put in a speech and which ones to leave out? I came in when the Richard Court government lost the 2001 election. Matt Burney was the only Liberal to take a new seat, and he'd won Kalgoorlie, the first Liberal in 100 years to win that seat. And I do hope that one day we'll see Matt back in Parliament. I was elected to the Upper House along with Alan Cadby, and that was the sum total. Alan was only in Parliament one term, but I consider him to be my friend. My first media campaign was when I was given the EPA amendment bill to take through the Upper House for the Liberals. Coming from a farming background, I knew that if this bill went through as was, well, then farmers would be in deep trouble. I learnt this bill and could parrot it in my sleep. Clearing dead trees was out. Cutting a branch of a dead tree was okay, but the dead tree had to stay. A wetland could have been a puddle. No more clearing along a fence line, and I could go on and on. I actually did at the time, and I made sure this bill <laughs> and the Honourable Simon O'Brien rem remembers me going on and on about that bill. It was taken to three drafts each time uh, it was made more palatable. It had over 160 amendments. I talked to farmer groups everywhere and worked with the PGA. I was appalled it had gone through the lower house, but having been in this place 16 years, that's part of the course. We are the ones that scrutinise the bills. I was on radio one morning taking the then minister, Judy Edwards, to task, and my dad, who was in the farm shed, heard me and yelled out to my mother that I had the minister by the leg and I would not let go. The Honourable Stephen Dawson, who worked for Judy Edwards at the time, would remember it well. <laughs> the amendment bill took a year for the process to go through Parliament, and in the end the Greens stepped in and negotiated a deal with Labor to allow a farmer to clear one hectare for the purpose of buildings. This was never ideal, and that bill still needs amending in many sections. But at least I had a few wins and farmers could still go about the business of farming. This showed me that even though I was in opposition, that I could be productive and make changes for the better. And perhaps the Honourable Stephen Dawson will have another look at the changes needed. Now he is the minister, and I congratulate you on becoming a minister, Stephen, and wish you well. The Liberals did make some changes, but it never went far enough. Opposition is hard work, and there are very few rewards. I was prepared to work hard, and if something went wrong, then I tried to right it. My sense of social justice and my love for children, especially those children in care or those being neglected, made me want to right all the wrongs and change things for the better. My background was as a welfare officer contracted to doing the social work in the South West. My colleagues called me the right-wing social worker. I have always, <laughs> never left wing, <laughs> 
I have always had the belief that people should not be given things without doing something in return, no matter how small it is, so that some responsibility is taken. I started my career in Albany, which looking back was a huge ask of anyone. I never had anything to do with the Albany community. It was three hours' drive from my hometown, but we had no Liberal covering that area, so I felt duty-bound to keep the Albany office open. I could never have been successful without the love, friendship and dedication of my electorate officer, Sandra Scott, and my research officer, Anne-Marie Mabs, or Ainge, as she is affectionately known. Thank you so much to both of you for the 14 years of dedicated service given to me. And in later years, Robin Robb also works for me, and she is just such a clever and lovely girl. I was very blessed with my staff in Albany. Albany was not easy for me. When Parliament was not sitting, I would leave my family and stay there four nights or more. I would watch city politicians come to Parliament and then drive five minutes down the road when I had many hours of driving to do. I had a few accidents along the way caused by getting home to Bridgetown at midnight and getting up at 4am to be in Albany for a breakfast event. I missed a T-junction in thick fog at 110 kilometres, took out a fence and missed a few trees. <laughs> I could see the trees coming just as the um, mud covered the, the windscreen and I placed myself in between those, those two trees. I was very lucky. This is an occupational hazard for country MPs. Fatigue causes accidents. We preach safety at work for others, but for us there is no such thing. I was lucky. I was unhurt each time. I had been given portfolios of seniors, Great Southern, women's interest and emergency services in my first term, as well as being on the Environment and Public Affairs Committee. So I had plenty to keep me busy in my first term, and I was always learning. My first international trip with the Parliamentary Committee was an inquiry on referral from the then Minister for Agriculture, Kim Chance, on GM crops, which took the Environment and Public Affairs Committee to Canada and America. And could I extend my sympathy to Kim's family on his passing? He was a very good minister and leader of the House, and I respected him greatly. The Honourable Bruce Donaldson, who is a good friend, always called me his shadow as nearly every time he went somewhere while overseas, I was right next to him. What I never told him was that Washington was a big place and Bridgetown is a small place and I didn't want to be left anywhere on my own. <laughs> he, he loved travelling and uh, we would always tease him that he had to smell the jet fuel at least twice a year or he would go tropo. He is once again overseas. <laughs> In my first term, the Honourable Norman Moore was leader of the Liberals in the upper house, and he is what I call a consummate politician. Some would call him tribal where the Liberal Party is concerned. 36 years in Parliament and now President of the Liberal Party. He taught me a great deal about politics, but most of it, unfortunately, cannot be repeated in here. At least I always knew who, who was who in the zoo, and that's all I'm saying. <laughs> When I was a minister, we were both in London House and he was a great help to me. In the early days, I was in awe of the Honourable George Cash and the Honourable Peter Foss. I see them sometimes and enjoy catching up. They could both stand up and speak for hours without notes and they would make a lot of sense. I wanted to be able to speak like them, but that would take practice. <laughs> I don't think I ever got up to their skill. There have been so many colleagues go through this place over 16 years, and I cannot name them all. But in my 16 years, I've found that each person that comes into this place has wanted to make a difference. I will say that in the past year, I've seen that change, and on my side of politics, it is now manipulation and less than honourable means used to get them in here. And that saddens me. They come here for the wrong reason, not the right reasons or they will be coming in here for the wrong reasons and not the right reasons. In my second term of parliament, I was given the portfolio that I loved and wanted, which was being the shadow for community development. I also had women's interests, heritage and local government. It was during 2005 that this department was failing children that were in state care. Caseloads were horrific, children were not being monitored, too many reports of child abuse were not being investigated, the culture in the department was totally dysfunctional. I worked tirelessly to point out the damage that was being done to children in care. They had always been my passion and I was disgusted at what was happening. 
I worked with a great journalist, Anita Dalton, and with each report coming out that was worse than the one before, I would give her what I wanted to say and miraculously a press release would appear. I would refine it and she would work on it until I was happy for it to be released. We were a great team and she's sitting in the President's Gallery today, such is our good friendship. Thank you, Anita. I had headline after headline in the West and was on radio at every opportunity pointing out where the government needed to improve. During 2006, <coughs> after numerous reports, I'd found out that many children had been abused while in care in a very short time. This was unacceptable to me and I moved for a royal commission. This was not successful, however I put forward that a select committee be formed to look at the adequacy of foster care in this state. With the help of the Honourable Giz Watson, this was successful and I chaired this committee. The Labor Party then launched another inquiry. This was the only time in that term that the Liberals formed a committee against the then government and I set the terms of reference. This inquiry was extensive and we went through departmental records and foster care procedures. I said in the press at the time, and I will say it again here as a reminder, I would not let my dog into some of the houses children were going into, and that was not that long ago. All the committee's recommendations were accepted, and I'm still to this day very proud of the work that we did. The headline that I will never forget is one that screamed out of the front page, Premier, why won't you protect our children? And then listed everything that was in the reports and how dysfunctional the department was. I did the job that a good shadow minister should and the director general had no choice but to resign and the then minister was moved to another portfolio. I breathed a sigh of relief when the Honourable Sue Ellery was given the opportunity to become the minister. She was only there for some 18 months when the government changed but had made some inroads into implementing those changes. And I'm sorry that she's not here today, but uh, the lovely girl that she is left me a lovely card um, to say some nice things about me. So um, please uh, pass that on to Sue. That, uh, thank you, it was a lovely gesture. In September 2008, the government changed and the Liberals found themselves in government I thank the Honourable Colin Barnett for giving me the opportunity to be a minister. I was delighted to be sworn in as the 21st female minister in this state since Federation with the ministries of child protection, community services, seniors and volunteers, and later I added women's interest and youth. I will say more about the appalling lack of women in parliament for the Liberal side a little later. In the four and a half years that I was minister, I changed many policies. I wrote the policy for child protection whilst in opposition and I was determined to implement them all. One policy I took to the election was that children who had no chance of staying with dysfunctional parent or parents when born or when coming to the attention of the department and put into care should be allowed to stay with their foster carers after a period of two years. This was called guardianship and this policy was a first in Australia. After two years, it allowed foster carers to apply to the courts to keep the child in their care. Parental rights were all but extinguished, except for religion and schooling, and of course the child always knew who their kin were. I went to the UK to look at their system, and because they have so many babies and children that have no hope of ever living with family because of the total dysfunction, they try to adopt them out before they are four years old. I thought adoption was too harsh and went with the softer option of guardianship. Children need to know who they belong to, but they do not need to live with hopeless drunk or drug parent or parents who don't have the ability or care about the child or children's welfare. I've seen too much over my years, and if people are not going to look after their children, then give them to others who will love them and who will give them a good grounding for life. When I left as minister, 300 children were in guardianship. I was out and about one day when a mum of twins who were about three came up to me and said, I want to thank you. These boys are now mine. They will go to Wesley School. They will have so many opportunities and we just love them so much. I looked at these boys and my heart melted. They were dressed beautifully and they were loved. If I was to tell you the background they were born into, you would never believe me. Income management was implemented by the 
then Labor Federal Minister Jenny Macklin, who I worked very well with, and, and myself, for those people who were neglecting their children. This was a wonderful program, and we tried to put it um, all over the state. I think I managed uh, Mandurah and, and up north, and uh, now they are implementing a card, something that, that we implemented uh, years ago, so it's just a new name and uh, um, doing new trials now. But it was for anyone. It just wasn't for Aboriginal people or one sector of the community. If you were neglecting your children, you were put on income management. I increased the child protection budget by some 59 per cent, implemented health checks for children in care, Rapid response health care was my policy and I systematically went through my policies and one by one implemented them. Mandatory reporting was shared by the Honourable Sue Ellery and myself, started by her and implemented by me. It was hard work but slowly the culture changed. New people were employed and there was a healthy mix of old and new, young and old in the workforce. Child protection is not an exact science and I may write a few educational books in the future. I've looked very closely at the McGowan government's changes to departments and I hope that the children in care will not be affected because of it. I'll be watching with great interest. I thank my ministerial staff, those who stayed with me and those who departed. All of them worked very hard for me and the government. And Domi, thank you. I know that you're watching today through the computer. While a minister, I made top of the world news. Australian news wasn't good enough for me. I had to go further and I did not know until I got a call from my daughter who works in the media and says, my God, Mum, what have you done? <laughs> I said, I don't know, what have I done? The first was front page when I said the burqa was alien to our culture and this went viral and I certainly still stand by that one. The second was when I said a particular pedophile should have his penis removed with a sharp instrument. Both cartoons had torn my wall. <laughs> I even made the New York Times. The cartoon Dean Alston did of me last week was rather curvaceous. I'm now on a diet. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> One of the hardest tasks I had was presiding over the redress scheme. Labor had promised a top payment of $80,000 for those people who were abused in state care, but the money had never been put aside when they lost government. When I went to Treasury and Cabinet, they told me no to the $80,000. I put up a proposal for 65,000 for top payment and once again was told no by Treasury and Cabinet. The top payment ended up being 45,000 and I had to justify that. I hated doing that as I knew it should have been more. I was proud of the way the scheme was rolled out but I was never and will never be satisfied that I had to set up a scheme that only paid $45,000 for the most horrific abuse that people could never in their wildest dreams imagine. Those places like Tarden, etc. Disgraceful. I hope that this payment will be topped up when compensation becomes available from the Royal Commission into child abuse. God knows that they deserve it. While a minister, I shared an office at Parliament with the Honourable Simon O'Brien and the Honourable Norman Moore. Simon and I also shared an office during this term I want to thank you, Simon, for your wisdom, support and friendship, and also to Joy. You can't talk about Simon without talking about Joy. I've never seen a couple that are so devoted, except for Mick and I, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you are staying, and I believe that with your knowledge, you will have a large part to play in the next parliament. You now hold the history. Eight years is a long time sharing an office. I'm sure you'll miss my colourful language that I used at times. You were a good minister and did not deserve the appalling treatment you were given. About six months before the 2013 election, I was having trouble walking and was in a great deal of pain. I kept working and driving great distances. Ministers are taught to ignore health and the show must keep going. When I was no longer a minister and had plenty of time to investigate what was causing my leg to fail, I was told it was coming from my spine and I needed an operation. This was not a good time in my life. Having spent four and a half years as a minister, working so hard, reforming a department, implementing new policies and then not being offered a place in Cabinet for the second term of government and then being in great pain is not a good recipe. 
The door was slammed and it was like the knowledge that I had went with that slamming door. I will always be grateful to the Honourable Liliana Ravlich. She said to me, and I will never forget it, Robin, everyone who sits on the front bench ends up on the back bench at some stage, whether by choice or election change or being put out of Cabinet. You did a great job and not many get to be a minister like you and I were. I consider Lil to be a friend. When she left here, she painted a picture of two birds that symbolised her and I. They were the same but different, and it hangs above my bed. Now, some people might think that's really odd that a Labor person and a Liberal person, both of us pretty tribal, <laughs> could end up good friends, but I consider her to be a good friend. During April of 2013, I went to Gallipoli at Anzac Cove for the dawn service. This was one of the highlights of my career, sitting front row, watching the sun come up over beautiful, haunting quietness. I laid the wreath at Lone Pine on behalf of the Western Australian Government. I was in a lot of pain, but I was not going to miss this trip. Mick and I were on a bus trip with other politicians, and we retraced where our Australians fought. The historian on board gave us amazing insight into the horrors of war for our Australian men and women. I had put my operation off for a little while until I could no longer walk, and then events took over. I was operated on, and the surgeon told me that if I'd left it any longer, that I would have been in a wheelchair. It took me some time to recover, and it certainly was a wake-up call. Being a minister was a privilege, however, working all hours took its toll. When a minister, I still had to drive to Albany from Bridgetown and across the electorate. My husband, Michael, became my driver most of the time. I would be dead now if Mick hadn't have driven me. And there's no other way to put it, I'd be dead from fatigue. I then moved my electorate office from Albany to Bridgetown, and this took some 18 months. Every member of the Albany branch of the Liberal Party was in town during this lengthy period. My staff in Bridgetown were two women that I'd grown up with, Beverly Walsh and Sue Tomkinson my friends, and it was lovely to have them work alongside me, both of them so very talented. Barbara Johnson, who has been a friend for over 20 years, was a shy president in Kununurra, plus had many other skills and does have many skills. Thank you to the three of you. My life was made easier because of you, and I know that they're watching uh, me via the computer at the moment. I have had just over two wonderful years in my hometown and was able to see more of my elderly parents. My father sadly passed away in June of last year and to be able to spend some more time with him was wonderful. My mother has now left the farm and lives in town. Such a strong lady. At 85 years of age, she chose and purchased a house and then she told us. I had good parents and a good foundation and I miss talking politics with my dad. The last four years I have immersed myself in legislation. As chair of the Legislation Committee, we've had a number of complex bills sent to us and we've done what the House has asked of us. I thank the Honourable Dave Grills, as I know how hard it is for country members, but he always turned up and was a great member to have on board. I hope that he can get a job training at Alt Rangers or doing something that he likes. One of the last committee reports was Bell Resources, and I very much enjoyed having the Honourable Ken Travis on the committee. Members would be posted onto the committee depending on their interests. We all worked together no matter what the makeup was. Both the Honourable Ken Travis and myself knew this particular legislation would never fly. I've had so many opportunities and I've taken them all, sometimes wondering just what I was doing at a particular place such as in Africa being stranded in the middle of six or eight non-conforming traffic lanes in a bus where the driver had walked off, leaving us in the middle of the road. The Honourable Barry House and another politician, together with myself, were bewildered, but he eventually came back. African drivers are a nightmare. I have had opportunities to travel to other countries on trade delegations and for legislation purposes. Two years ago, as Deputy Chair of the Children's Commissioner Oversight Committee, our committee travelled to Scotland, Ireland and England to talk to other children's commissioners. I have also travelled extensively throughout Western Australia and certainly extensively throughout my electorate. I know every back road 
And if I say it quickly, that doesn't have a policeman on it. <laughs> I, I, I sense of humour. Didn't mean it. I have enjoyed helping people, no matter what their problem was. Being a politician is not a straightforward role. There are so many facets to the job, and it is a profession that we should all be proud of. I want to get back to the topic of women, or lack of them, in the Liberal Party. I've been in the media saying that in the new parliament we will only have one woman in the upper house on our side, and what a woman she is. <laughs> the Honourable Donna Farragher is an accomplished young woman who I'm proud to know. She's also the mother of Harry and Claire and is a lovely mother. I'm going to miss hearing about Claire and Harry and their exploits. They're beautiful children, and this morning they've um, painted me a picture and said some really oh. kind words. <laughs> It is just sad that she will be the only woman on our side. Not only sad, but unacceptable. In the lower house, we have two women. I'm advocating to have targets with teeth. Enforceable targets? Why? I look at the last round of pre-selections and it, it is the men that are taking the top positions. Not in all cases, but in many regions. We have a new breed in the Liberal Party and it does not sit well with me. Women are 51 per cent of this state and this is not being recognised in this party. The Liberals need to lift their game or they will go backwards, further backwards. I was not in favour of the Labor Party quotas, but I've seen their women, who I think are not what I would say up to the job at the time of entering Parliament. However, after one term, they are. They have been mentored to become good politicians. The Liberal Party is not ready for quotas, but targets may start the ball rolling. I hope so. I was told I was too old for politics and needed to go. This is what I learnt the night before pre-selection. I'm not the only one in this house either. I was meant to be pushed off the ticket, but that never happened. However, it was the nastiest pre-selection I've ever been involved in. I'm 59 years of age, and if I was a man, that would never have been said. Mm -hmm. I listened to Wendy Duncan, and she said she was called Granny Duncan and not in a nice way. In my humble opinion, Wendy would have made a great minister. The parliament is poorer for her not being here. This attitude has to go. Women of my age and older have the knowledge and wisdom learnt from life, and they have the time to devote to politics. Men get grey in their hair and they're called distinguished. Women keep dyeing their hair so they don't get grey, so nobody calls them old. <laughs> Parliament and the traditions here are the ones that I hold very dear. Before I get on to family, I will say a little about some of the members I've worked with. I came into this place and the only other woman on my side was the Honourable Barbara Scott, who I know it was given a well-deserved Order of Australian Medal. I entered Parliament in 2001 with the Honourable Sue Ellery, the Honourable Adele Farina and the Honourable Kate Doust. I am going and they are still here. The Honourable Sue Ellery was Minister for Child Protection and then Shadow. We had a healthy respect for each other and I congratulate her on becoming Minister for Education and I wish you well. The Honourable Kate Doust, I am prematurely congratulating you on becoming, hopefully, becoming the first female president of this house. I know you will do it with grace and dignity that the office demands. Both Kate and I became nannies within the last couple of years, and I think for both of us that's more special than anything in the world. Well, for me it is, and I'm, I'm sure Kate, I've seen the smile on her face when she's held her little granddaughter, so I know. <laughs> the Honourable Adele Farina and I shared the South West electorate. It saddens me that you are not a minister. You are a lawyer, you work hard and deserve to get a promotion and you run rings around some of them. It says something when three Labor women are still members and four of our female members are going. The Honourable Sally Talbot came into Parliament the next term after me. I've always had a good working relationship with you, Sally, and shared, we shared an electorate. Sally is what I call a tribal Labor girl. <laughs> I wish you well in this Parliament. The Honourable Liz Beja I've worked with for eight years, and I always believe that if a member is working hard and doing a good job, then they should continue. I thought you were badly treated, Liz, and I wish you well for your next adventure in life. 
I introduced Michael Mission to his now partner Lorraine, who I've known since we were 10 years old. I took her to a Liberal function and I said to her, Michael's unattached, go and see if you like him. <laughs> he never had a chance to escape, but I don't think he ran very hard either. <laughs> The Honourable Ken Baston, thank you for your friendship and sense of humour. You are a good minister for agriculture. The Honourable Phil Edmund, who as the whip kept us all on our toes, however the other side to that is pears were given out on a very fair basis. I have a bone to pick in that I did not get my fair share of Toblerone. He used to give one out every week and I'd miss out. For eight and a half years, the Honourable Peter Collier has given me a glass of water at the beginning of each sitting day without fail. I must have annoyed him for a couple of days, as he forgot yesterday, but, but I got one today. I did get a glass of water today. <laughs> for four and a half years, I sat next to Peter in the first term of the Barnett government. I thank you, Peter, for giving me the opportunity to chair the Rural and Remote Education Board. Mia Betjeman, who was the first female clerk in this parliament, is the CEO, and I hope the Honourable Sue Ellery recognises her talent. I'm sure she will. Rick Mazza, I've always found you to be very practical and down to earth, and I wish you well. I know your party is called Farmers, Fishers and Shooters, but we just affectionately call it Shooters and Rooters or Rooters and Shooters. <laughs> Did I say that? I didn't say that. <laughs> to the uh, Greens, <laughs> I never agree with any of your policies. However, I have enjoyed working with the Honourable Robin Chapel and the Honourable Lynn McLaren in our committee work. You are good people. And Lynn, I wish you well in your next endeavours. To the National Party, I wish you well. I always like to tell the Nats that my great uncle William Carroll, who sat in this chamber, was the first senator from Western Australia to go to Canberra for the Country Party. The Honourable Colin Holt and I shared the electorate of the South West and Albany for a few years, and we always respected each other in the electorate. So Jackie and Marty, I wish you both well for the next, for the next parliament. If I have not mentioned the newer Labor members, I also wish you all well in your new government and the roles that you have. It is a great honour to be in government. The Honourable Helen Morton is not making a speech, but if she did, you would hear about the amazing changes that she put forward in mental health and disability. I respected her work ethic as she too carried a heavy load along with child protection. It seems that women have to work twice as hard even when they're sick, they're not allowed to be. And uh, I thank you for your work that you did in the state. Alyssa Hayden, I wish you well in your next adventure, wherever that takes you. The banter that you and the Honourable Jim Chowan had, I heard every day. I'm not sure who teased who the most. We sit long hours and the Honourable Jim Chowan has a sweet tooth and was always offering me his favourite sherbets. I never took them. <laughs> I did sometimes. I did sometimes. The Honourable Nick Goran is a very serious young man who has a good future ahead of him. He is like a dog with a bone if he thinks he's right, and, and he won me over when he would not let the Honourable Colin Barnett shut him up in the party room. He kept going. Well done, Nick. To be a politician, one must have good friends surrounding them, and even more importantly, a wonderful family. In the President's Gallery today, I have Derek and Beth Dilks. Derek and I were on council together some 20 years ago, and Beth was president of our local branch for many years. Both are dedicated community people. Thank you, both of you, for always having my back and being my friend. Lynn Whitney, who I've known all my life, and what an amazing lady she is. She runs an architectural drafting business and did this while her children were babies, twins amongst them netball coach, swimming coach and all things community. Married to Peter, who isn't here, but is also a dedicated community person. They too have always had my back, with Lynn also being secretary of the branch. Chris Dagg, who was our branch president and was also on council with me some 20 years ago, thank you for your friendship and the help that you give to people in our community. And Greg Giblet, Greg and Carol, Greg I've known all my life and Carol since she was 13 and I love it that Greg wanted to be here today to hear my last speech. Greg had a brother Neil who died in March two years ago and left us far too young. We were on council together as well. He always helped me on election day and was a great supporter of mine. I like to think that he's here in spirit. 
Anita Dalton, I've mentioned before, she's worked in this parliament for Brian Ellis, and he was lucky to have such a talented lady work for him, and she was lucky to work for such a lovely man. And I'm proud to call both of them my friends. I take this opportunity to thank the Parliament House staff, from our clerk Nigel Pratt to the Chamber staff, kitchen staff, Hansard and everyone who works, no matter what their role here. I want to thank Peter Gale, who's been here one year longer than me, for his professional manner and the help he gives us all, and Lisa and Hayley, who are in here, and uh, everybody in here. Lastly, I get to thank my family. My husband, Michael, who I met when I was 18 and he was 28. We've now been married for 40 years, and I couldn't have done this job without you, Mick. You've been my absolute rock. I've had to stop you wanting to punch out a few members over 16 years, and that four by two got very close sometimes. <laughs> I call him my crocodile Dundee the second, but I say it with pride and love because, well, he's my driver and I don't want to walk on him. <laughs> no, truly, I couldn't have done it without you. I have two of our children here today, Jenny and Holly, and Jenny's partner, Craig, who must be outside with the baby, Cooper with my only grandchild, apple of Nanny's eye, Cooper Joseph Myatt. Our other two children, Jason and his wife, Susan and Christy, are in Sydney at work. Mick and I are truly blessed with our family. They've had to put up with a mother who was always on the go, but I hope they know that they came first and always will. Craig and Susan have been a welcome addition to our family, and Craig, as the father of my grandson, gets a few more brownie points. <laughs> Inducement for another. Our children are amazing adults, and I love them dearly. So after 16 years, if I've missed anyone, it has not been intentional. I thank the people of the South West, and in particular those Liberal members who have always supported me. I sign off with a great sense of achievement and a job well done, as I know I put my heart and soul into making a difference. Not a bad effort for a girl who grew up in Bridgetown, a small country town in the South West. I know for me it is the right time to leave this place. It has given me so much and taught me so much. I leave you with a poem by Catherine Susanna Pritchard, born in 1883, because it's how I feel about parliamentarians who are in here for the right reasons, and I certainly was. For me to have made one soul the better for my birth, to have added but one flower to the garden of earth, to have struck one blow for truth in the daily fight with lies, to have done one deed of right in the face of calumnies, to have sown in the souls of men one thought that will not die, to have been a link in the chain of life shall be immortality. God bless you all and thank you. Thanks, members, and well done, Robin. Well done.